the uh, St. Joseph Valley Architects Association to announce that tomorrow there's a building code seminar in South Bend. Uh, total price is the price of the dinner, which is seven dollars. Um, Ed Malo, if you'll flail your hands back there, stand up or something. If anybody's interested in that, uh, I encourage you to get in touch with Ed Malo. <coughs> Our last speaker for tonight is uh, Fuller Moore. He's an associate professor of architecture at Miami o o University in Ohio. <coughs> he has two buildings, solar buildings, finished. One is the Whitewater Welcome Station in Whitewater State Park. The other is his own residence in Oxford, Ohio. However, I, <coughs> I might add that he's been a registered architect for a number of years. There's a lot of several buildings that are very nice and is justified in being uh, recognized as an outstanding architect ahead of being a solar architect. I'm having trouble hearing um, <coughs> Without any further ado, I'd like to like to introduce, oh, sorry, nobody heard me, right? Um, I'd like to introduce Fuller Moore. Oh, there you are. Oh, that's your there you are. Make sure they get the last book and fell off the last Okay. If you want to You can't turn the thing up down there. there. No, I mean. Well, I, I really am you sorry that I wasn't able to be here to hear Bob Schubert's uh, talk on passive systems. See, there's the difference. Uh, because I think some of the things that you saw, I did get a, managed to get a an after-the-fact preview, as it were, of some doing? of his slides up in the office just a while ago. And I think some of the buildings that that he showed you there are, in my way, I think some of the most exciting things that's happening in solar energy in the country. Uh, most of the work that I've been doing recently has uh, in solar has been dealing with active systems and I'd like to today to go through a fairly brief introduction of really what a passive system is I mean active system is and talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that I've been doing maybe share with you some of the mistakes that I've made on them and in hopes that you could benefit from those uh, could we go ahead and get into this slide? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, in terms of uh, the whole need and the current interest in solar energy, uh, there comes to mind uh, an anecdote that that I've told, uh, I think even here, and I hope those of you who have heard it will bear with me, of uh, the, in, in light of the energy crisis, uh, a great concern for uh, slowing down the uh, the stampede towards no nuclear energy, and the problem is that if you uh, if, if you do away with one energy source like nuclear energy, there are major problems in terms of fulfilling the the uh, even by the most conservative estimates the energy requirements that we're going to be facing in the next 20 and 30 years. Uh, it brings to mind the story of the. The fellow who was out backpacking and uh, came to the Grand Canyon and was so awestruck by the beauty of the canyon that he he stepped off into space and went plummeting down, down until he managed to snag on to a, a vine that was growing out of the cliff there. And here he is, no one's with him, no one's known he's fallen, and he's hanging 600 feet above the canyon floor uh, by this little small vine. And he says, uh, help, help, is there anyone up there? And finally, this omnipresent voice comes out and says, yes, I'm here. And uh, he looks around, doesn't see anyone. He says, uh, well, who is that? He said, this is the Lord. He said, well, can you help me? Can you help me? He says, well, I can help you only if you have faith. And he said, well, I've certainly got faith. He says, well, if you have faith, I want you to let go. He waited a second, and he said, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> and I think that's the story, that if you, uh, in, in, with the danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if you're going to, to take a second look at some of the, the, the dangers of nuclear energy and, and uh, refuse to be swept up in the, uh, in the tide of, of nuclear being the answer for everything, you better have something else on tap to at least partially relieve 
uh, the energy burden that we're going to be facing. I wouldn't for one moment propose that solar energy is going to be the end-all answer to that. But I would propose that for architectural space heating, that it's certainly a pretty attractive thing. One of the reasons is that it's a very diffuse energy source. And the requirements of architectural space heating, in fact, are very diffuse in their nature. Basically, what you're dealing with is an end product of 65 to 70 degrees. And it doesn't take burning uh, high, highly intense energy uh, storage methods such as uh, fossil fuels uh, to achieve that. And I think the, the diffuse quality of solar energy lends itself particularly well to that aspect of architectural space heating. Next. Do I, am I supposed to be punching? One of the real problems in considering architectural space heating uh, applications for solar energy in this climate is shown uh, with this chart showing the amount of sunshine available. And what you find is that Im immediately under Lake Erie, you get a really pronounced dip in the uh, total annual uh, sunshine hours. And what this chart doesn't even uh, show is that the greatest proportion of those uh, uh, cloudy days that occur uh, in this region occur during the winter time. For that reason, uh, this Midwest region is one of the least attractive uh, areas in the country for solar energy. But as you begin to face winters like we had this past winter, and as you begin to face rising fuel costs that even the most conservative estimates expect to be 15 to 20 percent per year, it begins to be more and more attractive to look towards a higher initial first cost balanced out against a much higher operating cost of more conventional energy. Uh, sources. Next. Sam, do you mind uh, punching that? Uh, to differentiate an active system from the ones that, uh, that Bob talked about this morning, a passive system, I, I think you could define an active system as a system that uses some mechanical means to transport solar energy that is collected and store it in some remote location away from the actual living space, and then to call that energy up, that stored energy up, uh, as it's needed in the building, again, usually by mechanical means. The difference, the essential difference, as I see it, between active, what we term active systems and passive systems, has to do with uh, the passive systems rely on the natural flow of heat by convection and radiation whereas the active systems uses mechanical equipment in the form of fans and uh, pumps to move this heat around. Sorry. Because of its ability to move it around at will, it allows, in many cases, the active systems a much greater degree of flexibility, uh, a much more sophisticated system, and a system capable of achieving much more closely regulated temperatures. I'm not at all convinced that uh, we can justify continuing to allow the occupants of building to essentially shirk their responsibility of maintaining, their, of taking some part in maintaining their thermal environment to the point that all they are required to do is simply to set a thermostat. But in any event, if you're talking about systems that are capable of achieving the comfort levels that our society is presently accustomed to, I think realistically you are talking about active systems. Um, almost all active systems have the following components. They have some type of collector, and for space heating purposes, usually that collector is what we call term a flat plate collector. It's a non-moving collector that's oriented uh, generally towards the south and tilted at some <coughs> angle to give optimum solar collection. In, uh, if you're talking about architectural heating only, usually that's the latitude that you're at plus 15 degrees. Uh, 
Uh, we're about uh, 40 degrees latitude here, so the optimum tilt would be about 55 degrees. Uh, in addition to the collector, next, you have uh, some me mechanism of removing heat from the collector itself and transporting it uh, away from the collector. Next. Some mechanism of storing the heat because uh, solar energy unfortunately works so that your most abundant period of collection ends up being at the time you need it least. And so uh, although they haven't perfected uh, any methods of storing heat on a year-round basis, there are widely accepted methods of storing it for relatively short periods of time, two to three to four days. And the idea being that you would uh, store that in some remote location for use within the structure at night or on an extended cloudy day period. Next. There's usually then some mechanism that transfers the heat from the storage to the space itself. And lastly, well, not really lastly, but next, some auxiliary heating system. Uh, people, to people who haven't uh, really had much experience with solar energy, they find that somehow the use of, or even putting in an auxiliary heating system to be almost a cop-out or an admission of defeat. Uh, and in reality, it's, in, it's not cost-effective to design a solar system to handle 100% of the heating requirements. That would require, to do that, you would have to size the collector and the storage to such a large capacity so as to handle that kind of once in five year, uh, uh, six day cloudy period with uh, 10 degree outside air temperature. And for the rest of the time, that capacity of the storage, uh, that excess capacity of the storage and the collector would be wasted. And considering that it costs just as much to build that that collector and the storage, that part of it that's being wasted as it does the part that's being used, it really, there's a trade-off there of the high cost, initial cost of the collector system with uh, comparing that with its frequency of use. And it's turning out to be with the current systems in this uh, region, uh, this typically this climatic region, that the most cost-effective uh, uh, the, the most cost-effective ratio is to try to get about 65 to 70 percent of the heating requirements from solar energy. Next. Probably the l least understood by the layman and quite honestly I think by, uh, by many uh, reasonably knowledgeable professionals in solar energy is the technology involved in control systems. Uh, the ability to make each one of those previous components work in conjunction with all of the other components so that you have, you're able to, to immediately have the system operate in its most effective mode of operation, whether that be collecting and heating the building directly from the collector or sending the heat from the collector to the storage or taking heat out of the storage and, uh, taking it directly to the building or combining heat from the storage with heat from the auxiliary or combining heat from the collector with heat from the auxiliary. To have all of those modes designed so that the system chooses which is the most effective means of operation at that particular time for those conditions ends up getting to be a pretty <coughs> complicated thing. And especially when you start talking about electronic controls that handle this automatically, you can get a substantial cost of the system uh, just in those controls. It also, though, seems to me that electronic controls being the nature uh, that they are, that that is the type of item that the cost will come down tremendously as these controls become standardized, whereas things such as the collector and the storage are, uh, I believe, reasonably close to uh, the price that they're going to be. Everyone keeps looking through, uh, saying that when they really get into mass production, it's going to bring the cost down. Uh, I have pretty serious questions of that mass production is just going to accomplish that. Uh, I think they're already mass producing them now to the point that they've gotten 
gotten that big drop down from the kind of cottage craft industry down to a semi-mass produced item. And I really don't expect to see a major cost breakthroughs just as a result of mass production in things such as uh, storage and the collector. But I think you will see that in the control systems. Next. Quite typically, the flat plate collector uh, operates with some type of absorber plate that uh, is highly absorptive to solar radiation. Uh, previously, the, uh, the flat black had been the most cost effective. Uh, some experimentation was done, was done with black chrome uh, selective surfaces. Uh, and I understand now that they have determined that certain uh, shades of green are in fact uh, very efficient absorbers. In any event, the idea is to absorb a maximum amount of that incoming radiation to reduce heat loss by re-radiation and uh, heat loss by convection by having some type of cover plate, usually in this climate two uh, glass cover plates, and then to uh, have the, uh, the collector insulated as well as possible to reduce uh, undesirable heat loss with the idea of trying to maximize the usable collected heat. Next. There are two fundamental types of uh, active systems. Uh, primarily, uh, the first, uh, we'll run through some examples here, that utilize uh, a fluid, uh, some liquid, as the transport medium of removing uh, the heat from the collector to the storage. Quite typically, uh, water, because of its high specific heat, its ability to, to, uh, uh, to store a lot of heat for each degree temperature rise, or some uh, non-freezing equivalent of water, is a very uh, popular means. And in fact, most of the work that has been done in active systems, I think it's safe to say, has been done in liquid systems. As you get into a liquid system, there are a number of problems. If you have a collector that the transport medium remains in throughout the, the life of the system, you can run into problems where after the, the pumping and the circulation of the transport fluid stops at night, there's a potential freezing problem. Uh, different uh, systems get at that problem in different ways. Some of them have a mechanism that uh, will drain the fluid out of the collector. Some of them have a vacuum, uh, a vacuum tube type collector that we'll look at, an example of one uh, that essentially insulates the uh, fluid to the extent that, it's, that freezing doesn't become a problem. And the more typical case uh, that's being used in most of the prefabricated manufactured collectors uh, are, is to use some type of antifreeze solution because no one can afford $3,000 worth of antifreeze to uh, uh, fill a storage container, usually some type of heat exchanger is necessary between the collector and the storage. And that is a potential reduction in efficiency. Um, one of the uh, self-proclaimed grandfathers of, the solar, uh, of solar energy is Harry Thomason, a patent attorney in Washington, D.C who developed uh, a trickling system that I think has been mi much uh, misaligned. I think uh, the, 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 the system that Thomason developed has now been proven to be one of the most cost-effective fluid systems on the market as far as an active solar system. Uh, I would not uh, insult your intelligence by proposing that his buildings have always been uh, excellent examples of architecture. But uh, I think the actual system, the collector system that Thomason developed, does, uh, does have a lot of credibility. Uh, next. A section through uh, the, the building that we, uh, in the previous slide, shows, shows how this works. Uh, the collector is a series of, uh, of, of corrugations, just simple uh, aluminum corrugated siding, that corrugations running up and down the surface of the roof with a tube running uh, across the ridge. And in the tube, over each corrugation, 
it's a very small hole. And uh, as, those, uh, as water is pumped up to the collector, any time the collector's surface is hotter than the storage, uh, the pump comes, comes on, pumps water through that top manifold, and water uh, squirts out these very small holes and sends a trickle. Actually, it's more, uh, it's really more than a trickle. It, it, there's a substantial flow of water down the valleys of those corrugations. Because the corrugations are kind of black and therefore absorb heat, and uh, actually the, the, the water being transparent allows the sunlight to come right on through the water, you end up with uh, the collector surface being heated and a substantial amount of that heat, a great amount of that heat being picked up by the water as it flows down the collector. You reduce heat loss by means of a cover plate or perhaps two cover plates, and the water is collected at a trough at the bottom, uh, a gutter at the bottom, and it flows down then into a, a, a storage tank. Uh, he surrounds the storage tank with uh, fist-sized stone. Harry's very, very specific about the size of the stone. And, uh, and then he blows air through the stones around the uh, storage tank and distributes that to the house itself. No one's quite sure why his storage system works, but apparently it does work quite well. It seems to, uh, there seems to be some uh, theoretical reasons why uh, the heat won't transfer out through the rock from the tank uh, because uh, the fact that each rock is just touching the adjacent rock in one very small place and the uh, conduction theoretically from one rock to another would be pretty minimal. But the system works and no one can deny that. Some studies at the University of Virginia have uh, finally once and for all pretty well established the validity of the system. Next. Uh, well, this is just a, a, perhaps a little more descriptive diagram showing the same uh, operation. He further enhances the efficiency of his collector through the use of an aluminum, uh, shiny aluminum surface on the top of, uh, uh, of, the top of that uh, glass uh, enclosed porch area, and that substantially increases the efficiency of his collector. Actually, the collector there, were it not for that reflector, would be at too steep an angle. Next. Much more typically is, uh, the, is this, which is the standard uh, kind of prefabricated modular collector that's uh, currently available. Next. There are any number of variations. This is the core of one typical collector, a uh, very efficient type that uh, has a maximum amount of fluid flowing right under the collector itself. These are uh, sandwich, uh, uh, either aluminum or copper panels. Uh, obviously, the copper is preferable to the aluminum because of problems with corrosion, but there is a substantial cost advantage in using the aluminum system. And if antifreeze is going to be used anyway, then uh, probably the use of the aluminum could be justified. Their efficiency is quite large, uh, is high because of the large amount, uh, or the the large amount of the surface of the collector that is in direct contact with that transport fluid. Uh, quite typically, the costs of uh, the square foot cost of collectors such as this range between uh, twelve and fifteen dollars per square foot of collector panel. But that's the entire panel, including the glazing, uh, the insulation ready to bolt onto the roof. By contrast, Thomason's collector was much less efficient, but uh, could probably be built for on the order of uh, about $5 a square foot. Next. Probably the ultimate in kind of uh, high technology uh, applications is this Decade 80 solar house. Uh, they found when they did the calculations that uh, only about 60% uh, of the area uh, of the roof was needed, but uh, since it was a promotional uh, project for the Copper and Brass Development Association, and since uh, the architect originally envisioned the whole uh, roof being covered with collector, and since they manufactured the collectors anyway, they covered the whole roof with collectors. It, uh, it's, it's shallow slope there uh, is the result of, number one, a fairly low latitude in Arizona, and the, uh, uh, the, the fact that the uh, collector panels are serving not only to heat, which is no uh, great problem 
considering the amount of area of collector that they have, but it's also used to power an absorption air conditioning system, uh, very similar in principle to the old gas refrigerators. Uh, as I understand it, they've had considerable problems in gaining high enough temperatures out of the flat plate collector to uh, reliably power the air conditioner, and in fact, the air conditioning system has been inoperable about 90% of the time. I think that the, the technology is present uh, that allows you to use uh, solar energy for air conditioning systems, but I really question whether uh, flat plate collectors are the way to do it. In any event, to me, this is probably the extreme, even to the point of ridiculous, uh, ridiculousness uh, uh, is to uh, one extreme versus what you saw at the other extreme this morning with some of the passive approaches. Uh, if you go into the mechanical equipment room, uh, it's, it's just like something out of a submarine or a spaceship. Uh, and to expect that the average homeowner and the average uh, heating repair man within the near future is going to be able to comprehend and even maintain this system, I think is asking a lot. And for that reason, I'm becoming more and more an advocate of simple is beautiful. The most simple solar system, believe me, will be complicated enough. And there are plenty of places for it to go wrong without making it unnecessarily complicated. Next. Quite typically, uh, uh, the system might be something like the black focus any, any better. Um, the uh, one typical integration that I, I rather like is, uh, is shown in this diagram where you have uh, the, the collector, uh, a water type collector with water pumping up to the roof. In this case, it's, since it's a trickling collector like a Thomson collector, they're pumping it to the top first and letting it come down. And uh, more uh, typically, the systems that operate under pressure will pump it from the low side of the collector up. In any event, uh, what I particularly like is the, uh, the way that he ha has added the auxiliary heat by completely separating the auxiliary heating from the, uh, the active solar system. It enables him to run the solar system continuously to give a background heating in the winter, even if it's incapable of handling the entire heating load. And for then the auxiliary heating system, in this case, just simple baseboard electric, uh, electric baseboard convectors, to operate without the danger of either dumping heat from the electrical uh, electric auxiliary back into the storage or reducing the gain that you're getting from the solar system. Uh, it seems to me that either of those two alternatives, in other words, reducing the flow from the storage and Putting more, putting on more auxiliary, or uh, the the likelihood of somehow using the uh, auxiliary to store the heat. Uh, I think either one of those are a bad approach, and but unfortunately they're quite typical, uh, where the auxiliary heat might be just used to boost the temperature of the water, and in that case. Uh, if it just simply boosts the temperature of the water from the storage, you're going to end up with the water being returned to the storage at a higher temperature than it would have if it were just running directly from the storage. And the alternative to that is somehow th uh, closing this circuit. If you had, say, an auxiliary heater here, closing the circuit and not drawing off the storage and using only auxiliary. In any event, that's a kind of a personal engineering preference that I have. But it makes the integration of the auxiliary system with the, uh, the solar system, to me, pretty important. Next. This is a system that uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Um, to my way of thinking, it's probably the most cost-effective system in terms of BTUs per dollar around today. It's uh, being uh, fabricated on a, well, let's say a large scale if you consider it a cottage craft art, but a small scale considering mass production techniques. Uh, it's being manufactured up here in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, the system basically has all of the advantages of a pressurized 
water system in that he can accurately control the flow with the pump and the velocity through the collector, which is something that a trickling system such as Thomason's could not do. Once he releases that water at the top, it's, it's free to run by at the gravity speed down the collector. Whereas this system pumps it in at the bottom, pumps it up uh, through the vertical tubes to the top, and across the top he has, at the end, it's not shown in this uh, sample panel, but in the installations he uses something like uh, an automatic radiator uh, vent, typically found on uh, baseboard convectors, that allows uh, air to come in and go out, but does not allow fluid to go out. And what happens is when he cuts the pump off, at the end of the day, as soon as the pump cuts off, the water flows back to the tank by gravity. Air is allowed to come in at the very top, and the whole system drains down. And that has, to me, a tremendous advantage in that it still allows him to control the flow through the collector, but he doesn't get into the freezing problem that most other pressurized systems get into. Uh, he fabricates, the t typically it's fabricated with uh, the, the uh, return tube up at the peak of the roof and a supply tube at the bottom. He uh, uh, drills and solders fittings on there and then just simply copper tubing going up between those. There's a twisted spiral of brass that's fitted inside of the tube that induces in, uh, extra turbulence to the water as it flows through it. And then, next slide. Maybe some of these will show the details a little better. These are just kind of blow-up details showing the solder connection that he, he uses at the manifold. Uh, he uses a reflective uh, insulation to, uh, uh, to reflect heat uh, that would be uh, radiated out of the back of the panel back to the panel to the collector surface itself. The actual collectors themselves, the, uh, uh, the absorbers, are, 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 are pieces that snap onto that tubing. The examples shown here are have them painted flat black, but he's actually uh, is uh, applying a selective coating of black, uh, uh, a, a black selective coating of zinc oxide onto the surfaces. Next, uh, this just shows one of the uh, typical plumbing fittings at one end of it. Next. This, the glazing material that he's using here is an acrylic fiberglass that was developed originally for greenhouse use. It's treated for, uh, to reduce ultraviolet degradation and has uh, not quite the transmission qualities of glass, but very close. And uh, the costs, especially in terms of installation, make it a very desirable uh, glazing uh, choice. I think uh, it also has uh, advantages in terms of uh, it comes in a roll and can be uh, rolled down without any joints down the entire slope of the roof. Next. This shows the different, uh, this is the black chrome that's been handled so much most of the chrome's actually worn off. Uh, this shows a copper one and I can't remember the, the this is a steel collector which is typically what he uses and I can't remember the plating but it was very close to copper on the electrolytic spectrum, so he doesn't have a problem with uh, uh, an electrolytic transfer between the copper tube and the plate itself. Next. Those ended up being snapped on in two-foot sections uh, by four inches wide all the way up the roof. And uh, I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm very impressed with the quality of that product, and I think we're talking about, in terms of install cost, counting the glazing and the components, about the same price the Thomason system is. This is uh, my own residence. The, uh, I guess I should have shown the next slide first. I think. Uh, that's what it's like during the summer, and everyone asks me, well, how does the sun ever get in? And uh, if you back up one, of course, uh, the sun comes in simply because the leaves very conveniently drop their leaves exactly uh, at the beginning of the heating season and fill back in exactly at the beginning of the cooling season. I'm convinced that the deciduous tree is the greatest architectural invention in the last 50 years. Uh, 
that uh, we the the plank that you see up there on the collector that's holding the snow up there was we were up there patching a leak in it and the snow uh, caught us. But normally the snow builds up to about a half inch and then just sheets off of the roof itself. Next. Uh, in plan, uh, we built it onto the south sloping hill, and I think you will find that as people begin to figure out how nice how nice south slopes are, and the fact that you can build a part of the house into the side of the hill to reduce heat loss on the north, east, and west sides, and still have a southern exposure for solar collection, you're going to find that uh, that you're going to start having to pay a premium for uh, south sloping land. In any event, uh, south being to the left here, uh, the basement area was primarily garage where we drove in here, utility room, uh, and stairs up uh, to the main part of the house. And then the second floor, which is really our main entry floor where we would enter from higher on the hill on the northeast corner, enter into the building. Uh, we, my wife uh, uh, was refused to compromise on anything, but. Uh, uh, or refused to compromise on an east exposure so we could have morning sun into the into the kitchen and the dining area. And uh, so we managed to juggle the plan around so that we, although we had to enter on the east side, we did get the kitchen and the dining area there. The living area and uh, separating the living area from that little study area is one of our auxiliary heating systems and fireplace. And, and then that opened out onto a deck. Next. Uh, the two uh, children's bedrooms were open to a loft space above. You can see on the first <coughs> floor uh, that loft space with the loft overlooking the two children's bedrooms. And then the master bedroom area looks down into the uh, space, uh, uh, the dining room and living room space below. All of that, of course, means that the house is very open plan, and it is a distinct disadvantage in heating but it's a distinct advantage in uh, this climate if you're going to attempt to design the house to, uh, uh, to, to not depend on uh, air conditioning. And with the combination of the deciduous trees and the tall open spaces, we haven't had to uh, have been at all uncomfortable at any time during the year. I think last year we would probably cut on an air conditioner twice if we'd have had it, but really didn't miss it then. Um, we do use, in order to prevent the stratification of heat during the winter, we have a, a, a fairly simple air uh, uh, return grill high in the peak of this building, and that blows that hottest air that stagnates at the top. It takes that out of the peak of the building or the house and then recirculates it down lower. Next. In, in, sec in, in elevation, uh, it looks like this with obviously the slope, uh, the 45 degree slope sloping toward the south, that's really not as steep as is an optimum slope. At, uh, at our locale, uh, 54 degrees would have been optimum, but I found that uh, 54 degrees did things to, uh, to the interior spaces that I really didn't want, and fortunately, there's about a 10 degree latitude on either side of that optimum that you can go without paying very much of a penalty. Uh, my wife claims that uh, my, latent, uh, my latent enjoyment of sailboats, it came out somehow in the profile, but I'm not, I can't see it at all. Uh, next. Uh, in section, uh, then here we have the garage area with kitchen and dining area on the east side, and beyond that, the, uh, the living area and the two children's bedrooms with the a drafting loft and a dark room area that I have up above that. And then this is a portion of the master bedroom that looks down into the dining and living area below. And a deck out on the south side. It ended up that the deck with those wing walls that come out to support the cantilever ended up uh, working out quite well. We, we planned on it, but I really hadn't planned on how nice it would work. It formed a kind of a dead air pocket. And in the spring and in the fall, we can really go out and enjoy that space because it's protected from the wind during the day uh, at a time when it otherwise would be quite uncomfortable. Next. Schematically, the system uh, was originally intended to be a Thomason system, and it, in terms of operation, still ended up very similar to his. 
Uh, anytime the collector is hotter than the, the water temperature in the tank, a pump comes on, pumps it up to the top of the roof, the water trickles down the collector and is returned by gravity to the tank. Uh, anytime the house is calling for heat, uh, a thermostat kicks on this pump. First of all, well, first of all, it kicks on the fan that recirculates the air from the hot, that peak of the roof down to the lower part of the house. Then the second stage of the thermostat cuts on the pump which circulates the water through the uh, uh, just standard baseboard radiators in the house, baseboard convectors. Because we were using a lower temperature, we had to approximately double the total uh, amount of those radiators that we would have had we used a conventional hot water system. And then lastly, uh, we have the uh, uh, preheater where we come in through a coil of water that's submerged in the solar storage tank to preheat hot water, uh, to pre preheat uh, drinking water on its way to the hot water, uh, the regular electric hot water heater. Uh, this is the uh, solar tank. Uh, it was a precast concrete system uh, and uh, it's a 3,000 gallons uh, concrete cistern. Uh, 3,000 gallons, about 10 foot long, about 5 foot wide, about 5 foot tall. Uh, it leaked like a sieve. I spent an awful lot of time at the bottom of that tank trying to to find and, and patch up leaks, and uh, I would take any claim that a, uh, a cistern or a, uh, a septic tank manufacturer makes about its uh, water tightness with a decided grain of salt in the future. I think I've got the leak stopped now, but I've had a great deal of problem with it. Uh, I oversized the tank uh, grossly. I think had I realized that I that really the optimum was more on the order of about a thousand gallons or about one and a third gallons of water per square foot of collector I would have certainly found a space in the uh, in, in within the house itself to have put the tank I'm sure I'm losing some efficiency in the system because the tank well uh, although it, it ended up being buried we refer to it as the sacred solar burial now uh, it I'm sure we're losing some heat through the insulation. We ended up uh, using uh, two inches of foam insulation around it and then putting a waterproof membrane around that. Uh, next. Uh, once the water is pumped up to the roof, it's distributed through a multi-stage manifold uh, out to, to feed this overall ridge pipe. Since I was going with a slightly different uh, system that Thomason used, mine was not going to be a, an open flow system such as his. Uh, uh, it was to be a trickling system, but it was the idea was to close the valleys, as it were, that or the troughs that Thomason uses, to try to reduce uh, some of the problems of condensation on the glass and, and excessive evaporation. In order to do, do that, it was necessary, rather than just having holes in this manifold, to actually have tubes coming off of it that fed into it. I didn't have any idea at the time I designed the system the problems I was making for myself in terms of uh, once you get substantially large sized holes on the order of a quarter of an inch spaced out across that, the, the uh, hydraulics of, of the system changes from essentially one of the whole top pipe being pressurized to essentially, uh, because of the large number of larger openings, essentially that top pipe is acting like a dam that allows water to flow over. Any minute variation in the level of that re resulted in really gross differences in water flow across the collector. Uh, we tried to balance the flow through the channels in the collector uh, by a very scientific method known as the dual Dixie cup technique where we would have one control tube and then we would pinch off the next tube until we tried to get the flow so that it filled up the two Dixie cups at an equal rate and after thoroughly mangling about a half a dozen of them we decided that we really had to have a more precise control method than next tube. We finally, uh, well this shows the collector itself, let's go on to the next one first. Uh, and then come back to that. We ended up using standard gas cock valves, and uh, 
I think I, uh, I would certainly recommend that if you are foolish enough to try to duplicate my system that you definitely include gas pipe cock valves. Uh, next, uh, yeah, this is, uh, shows the actual collector itself, a section through it. Un, uh, in, in trying to get away from the problem that Thomason was having, or, or and I think still is having with condensation, uh, everyone acknowledges that to be a problem except Thomason, uh, I tried to, to essentially close over the top if I can. Where is that? Is that up on the top? Uh -huh. Okay. What we essentially did was took copper foil, bent it into this shape, and, uh, and inserted the tube at the top into that space there allowed the water to flow down through that and to prevent the water from splashing out and to reduce evaporation, I sealed that with uh, a caulking compound. And the idea was, it, it, it was an idea that I really was making here was a prototype with the idea that eventually you might mass produce an item that had that configuration. It could come to the job collapsed and, uh, and a roll and you could just unroll it, snip it off, and blow open those uh, tubes with air pressure or water pressure and have a fairly inexpensive system in terms of the uh, installation cost. The, uh, uh, because it was very difficult to, uh, uh, let's see, let's go on to, well, that's okay. The idea was that we were going to, uh, to in order to be able to form that, it was not possible to form multiples of those, so we formed one set at a time. And I, I did a test using aluminum, and we were able to actually draw that aluminum through a wooden die and form that shape. And so we set the wooden die, got our uh, specially cut roll of copper from the manufacturer, and set up our die at the base of the roof with the idea that we would insert the uh, uh, copper foil in there, draw it up through the roof, uh, draw it up through the die, walk up the roof, snip it off, staple it in place, and go on to the next one, and uh, finish it by mid-afternoon and go out for a beer. 400 man-hours later, what we found was that the, the, the copper was entirely too stiff. It crimped as it went through, and we ended up having to form this uh, shape up using kind of specially made wooden tools to get a kind of a triangular valley in there. Uh, this shows the finished piece with the caulking seam on it. Uh, we had to form it up piece by piece. It took about an hour and a half to form each one, and it was 55 of them uh, with three of us working. That doesn't come out to 400 hours, but believe me, it took that long. As we worked our way across the roof, we were installing glazing channels. And uh, next, this was we ended up looking uh, somehow the spacing got off on this particular one, but you can see the configuration of the copper is it switched back on itself, and then the sealing and the stapling. We've had problems with the copper uh, becoming brittle and breaking in places, and, so, and, and, and some of the water coming out over top of the collector, and some of the uh, uh, and we've also had problems with some of the staples working loose. Next. This shows the copper just about in place. Uh, this is our rig that we finally ended up coming up with to be able to work up and down on the collector. Uh, you end up getting quite uh, uh, quite a daredevil on a 45 degree slope, 45 feet to go up the ground. But uh, we found that we actually were able to work using this rig quite well. Next. And uh, applying the, the paint, it ended up being a three-part process of etching the copper first using a zinc dust primer and then a black coating uh, known as Nextel, which is a, a very velvet uh, black, flat black surface uh, of, of the avail readily available paints. It seems to have some of the best optical characteristics. Just the process of running down this combination of etcher, primer, uh, paint was an incredible operation. Believe me, I think we spent about $50 worth of long distance phone calls. No one had ever put it on copper before, but everyone was sure it ought to be, it ought to work. 
and I would call down to one place and he'd say, no, I was using aluminum there. Why don't you try so-and-so in California? It seemed like I remember he was working on something and you'd call him and he was working on something quite different. And in any event, we finally got it uh, on where I found out a few things in the process. One is you don't mix up the acid etch for the copper in a galvanized bucket and leave it overnight. <laughs> Uh, in any event, after we finally got it on, then we started putting the glazing on it. Next, next please. And uh, that gives you a pretty good idea of just how flat black that, that, uh, that paint ended up being. It really did look like velvet. The glazing went on quite fast. It was a, tip, a standard greenhouse glazing system. I think for solar applications, it's probably not very good. It, uh, the aluminum channels, while they're very good for, for weathering and durability, they do conduct heat out almost like a fin from the collector, although it wasn't in contact with the copper. The space under the glass gets quite warm, uh, and the aluminum conducts it out readily. Uh, I think uh, uh, because of some of the problems that we've had, I'm planning this summer to replace the collector portion itself, the actual collector surface itself, with or at least one or two panels of that with uh, Grider's collector, the one previously that we showed that's kind of snapped together, and see how that works. I think uh, if I had it to do over again, I would use a double glazing on there and probably go with the cow wall, the uh, acrylic fiberglass. Next. Uh, not really related to the uh, active part of the solar system was uh, our use in order to reduce some of the heat loss from the house without reducing uh, the window areas, we found we just had a, a marvelous selection of views from the house, and I, I wanted to, uh, to open the house up to those in the summertime. Uh, our solution was to develop uh, an insulating shutter that really was just a standard uh, two foot eight wide by six foot eight tall pre-hung hollow core interior door. It comes from the factory as a standard item usually used for interior doors with the frame, the hinges, everything in place. And what we did was simply frame those into the wall and then put glazing on the outside of the door. And it worked out quite well. We used a standard uh, Anderson basement window for the vent and pretty well standard on, standardized on that shape through most of the house on the two south facing glass, large glass uh, areas, we used a modification of that. Uh, next, this will give you an idea of what they look like. This uh, is a south facing patio door that goes out with some additional fixed glass above. This panel here closes as does the top panel. This panel over here closes against that glass and it took some real doing to get the carpenter to get those framed in so that when they close together they would match like that. But, uh, I thought it worked out pretty well. Next. Uh, this is what they look like uh, from the outside when they're closed. Unfortunately, you, it's usually dark when they're closed, so you don't see it. Our sequence is, it really gets to be a kind of a nice ritual. Uh, as we, uh, uh, after dinner, after it gets dark, we'll generally close the shutters <coughs> up. And in the, on colder days, we'll leave the shutters closed in those rooms that we aren't actually using, and then open up the shutters in the areas that we are using uh, toward the sun and just kind of move it, let it move around with the sun. And I've found that it's really increased our awareness of number one, the kind of implications of what the sun means in terms of energy usage. Uh, the shutters have done that a lot more, I think, than the, than the active solar system has in terms of making myself and my wife really aware of kind of the, uh, that relationship that you end up uh, establishing for yourself with the sun when you go with the solar system. Next. Uh, water, by all means, isn't the only mechanism of transferring heat from the collector to, uh, to the storage. Air systems are becoming increasingly popular. Having built my own water system, I can understand why. You don't have a uh, catastrophe when you have a leak with a water with an air system. You don't have any problems with boil off uh, during the summertime if your pump fails to operate and your collector heats up to 300 degrees. 
uh, boiling off your supply of antifreeze. You don't end up with any freezing problems, obviously, because there's nothing there to freeze. Uh, although the air itself is not as efficient in terms of moving BTUs uh, around as water is, in fact, it's, uh, uh, it's considerably less efficient. Uh, it takes less energy to run a pump that, to move a certain number of BTUs uh, with liquid as uh, it takes considerably less to do that than it does to run a fan to move a comparable amount of heat with air. Uh, you also run into a situation with air systems is that the size of the ducts to supply the collector ends up being a, a, of, of, a, of a, a noticeable and significant size. And unless you really allow for that in the design of the building, uh, that can be a real problem. I think it gets to be a major problem as you begin to talk about systems that are larger than a residential scale. And it's my general feeling that if you're talking about active systems, that probably uh, air type systems are generally more, can be built cost effective with less problems than can a water system. I think the, the problems involved with an air system does not require the technical know-how for maintenance that a water system does. And I think the problems, when they do develop, are less severe. There's obviously no corrosion problems that you run into with some water, water system. Um, typically, uh, uh, air systems flow in contact with the collector. One early version of an air collector was th this uh, schematic shows uh, one by Dr. George Lurf in Denver, Colorado where he had uh, on his collector a series of overlapping glass plates. And where those glass plates or kind of shingles overlapped one another, uh, they were painted flat black. And as the sun would shine through the top cover of plates and then shine through those individual overlapping plates and then finally get through to the black, the greenhouse effect was increased because of the large number of layers of glass that had gone through. Unfortunately, it also decreased the amount of solar radiation actually reaching that absorbent surface. And uh, in fact, this, that system is not proven to be very efficient. There were some initial major problems with getting uh, the black on the glass and getting it on in such a way that the, black, the, grass, the glass did not crack due to a differential expansion uh, uh, because of the difference in temperature.